OK, so welcome, everybody. This is the, um, the last in our 2019-2020 programme of events. Um, I will give an introduction to our presenter in a moment. Um, we also wanted to remind you about our next programme. Uh, so the committee of the BCS Oxfordshire branch have been hard at work gathering good speakers for the next programme. Um, that's about 80% ready now. We'll be publishing that uh, when we can. Uh, what we wanted to do was just to remind you that we're going to have a summer break after this pro this talk, uh, and then our first talk back will be on the on Thursday, the first of October, uh, and that will be presented by Professor Phil Howard from the Oxford and Internet Institute. Um, he's presented to the to our branch before, and his talk this year is "Lie Machines: How to Save Democracy from Troll Armies, Deceitful Robots, Junk News Operations, and Political Operatives." And in fact, this is the title of his recently published book on which the talk is based. Uh, we're working on the assumption that we're going to carry on giving these talks uh, virtually via um, this, this platform, GoToWebinar, uh, uh, when the talks begin again in the, in the autumn. But obviously, as soon as we can get back to giving face-to-face -face presentations, we will do so. And hopefully, we'll be able to continue running um, some kind of virtual presentation in parallel. Um, if not that, then we will continue to provide the recordings where the speaker allows us to do so. Um, all the usual information for the forthcoming programme will be published on the website, so keep checking back at that um, and you'll be able to see when the uh, the new programme is, is published. So um, today's speaker is uh, Andrew Lahif from the Cullum Centre from Fusion Energy. Uh, he's going to talk to us about uh, HPC, high performance computing and high throughput computing. Uh, as I'm sure most of you know, or many of you will know, um, these are tools and technologies used in very complex uh, technological uh, problems where you have to break them down into multiple analysis um, uh, chunks and then send them off to a vast array of computers to analyze them. And in addition to that, um, cloud computing has allowed us to access massive resources in many different platforms from Microsoft to Amazon to various um, uh, non-US based um, technologies. And that means that we have at our fingertips lots of different types of, of um, high performance computers. And Andrew's talk is about how we manage to, to swap and change between those. So um, I will now turn off my webcam and uh, hand over to Andrew. And um, we're very grateful and, um, and pleased to have him speaking for us. Okay, um, thank you, Andrew. Um, so, as Andrew said, my name is Andrew Layoff. I work in the Advanced Computing Group at the Cullum Centre for Fusion Energy. Um, so I've been there for a couple of years. Before that, I've worked on data processing and computing for two ESA and NASA science missions. Um, and more recently, I was involved with the computing for the Large Hadron Collider. However, today I'll be talking about um, how we're using supercomputers, private and public clouds opportunistically to run HPC and HTC applications um, in Fusion research. So uh, to begin with, I'll just give a brief overview of my talk. Um, I'll give a, to begin with, I'll give a brief introduction to the Cullum Center for Fusion Energy and the research that takes place there. Um, I'll then be talking about um, computing in Fusion Energy research and how and why we're moving to using um, containers and clouds. And then finally, I went with some going through some example fusion use cases. <clears throat> okay, so the before yeah before talking about computing, I think it's just worth worthwhile to give a bit of background information about what we're going what we're using the computing for. Um, so the Cullum Centre for Fusion Energy is located at Cullum in Oxfordshire, which is not far from. Abingdon. Um, so the CCFE is the UK's National Energy National Nuclear Fusion Laboratory. Um, so nuclear fusion, as a lot of people probably know, that's the energy source that powers the sun and all of the stars. That's caught and it's caused by light nuclei fusing together to form a heavier nucleus, and that process reduces a lot of energy. Um, so in recreating fusion on Earth, uh, what happens is that um, hydrogen isotopes, normally deuterium and tritium, 
are heated to very high temperatures, um, like over 100 billion degrees Celsius. And the eventual, and the reason for doing that is that it's, the aim is to produce energy, which can then be used to generate electricity for the grid. And the advantages of fusion compared to um, fission is that there's much less um, long-lived radioactive wastes than nuclear fission, and there are no greenhouse gases produced. Such a much cleaner form of energy. Um, so now I'll just go through a couple of the uh, major experiments that are either operated by CCFE or a CCFE is involved with. Um, so first of all, there's JETS, the Joint European Taurus. Um, this is currently the world's largest tokamak experiment. Um, a tokamak is a device which uses powerful magnetic fields to confine and control a hot plasma. Um, so as I mentioned before, they need to have very high temperatures. And of course, that's you don't want to have these high temperatures in um, touching the container that the plasma is in. So what you need to do is to use magnets to um, confine the plasma. And we do that usually using a tokamak. So JETS is currently the world's largest tokamak, and that's at CCFE. Um, there's also an experiment called MAST, Mega Amp Spherical Tokamak. And this is the UK's nuclear fusion experiment, which is a um, slightly different form of tokamak compared to JET. Um, CCFE is also involved with ITA. So ITA is, well, ITA will be the world's largest tokamak, and it's currently being built down in the south of France. Um, so one big difference between ITA and previous experiments is that ITA will produce more power than the power that is used to actually heat the plasma. So obviously, if you want to produce electricity, then you need to produce more like, produce more power than what you actually use. And the aim of ITER is to produce 500 uh, megawatts of fusion power from 50 megawatts of input heating power. And finally, um, there's STEP. So this is a UK program to design and build the world's first compact fusion reactor. Um, so the aim of this is to prove the viability of um, using fusion as a technology for generating electricity. Uh, so one common thing throughout all of these experiments and sort of planned experiments is that they all require computing. Uh, so now I'll start talking about computing in fusion and how it's sort of typically been done in the past. Um, the important thing to note in that fusion, it's not just sort of one field, but there are many fields involved. Um, for example, there's plasma physics, there's materials research, there's engineering, and sort of variety of other things. And because of the sort of wide variety of fields involved, that means there's people need to run a wide variety of applications. So there's plasma modeling, um, materials research, lots of engineering and design, um, data processing, processing of data from experiments. Um, there's things, new things like uncertainty quantification, where you um, investigate uncertainties and sort of possible errors in models. Um, there's also like rendering um, images and movies. And now sort of machine learning is starting to be um, used as well. So in the fusion research community today, um, one thing to note is that distributed, distributed computing uh, doesn't currently exist. Um, so for example, with CERN's Large Hadron Collider, um, for over the 14 years or more, um, they've used distributing, distributed computing. So all of the data um, from the experiments are sort of sent all around the world and processed and analyzed at lots of different um, facilities all around the world. Whereas in Fusion, the um, data volumes are much smaller, so it doesn't, so far it hasn't required as much computing. And so typically the computing just takes place at sort of one site that's associated with an experiment. Uh, so yeah, so there are basically isolated islands of data and compute resources, which are typically a supercomputer with um, associated shared storage, for example, NFS or Lustre or some other type of sort of shared file system. And it can be difficult to access data and these computing resources at other sites. So you sometimes you have to, if you want to access data, you have to get an account on the computing system that's associated with it, which obviously takes time. 
Um, so that sort of makes things quite difficult for people. Uh, another important point is that the software isn't portable. I'll talk about that more in a moment. Uh, so in Fusion, there are two types of computing um, involved. There's high throughputs and computing HTC and high performance computing, that's HPC. Um, so there's, so HTC is, I guess, a simpler form of computing where each job just runs on a single node. Um, you generally would run sort of large numbers of these at the same time. Whereas with high performance computing, each job runs on multiple nodes. So you could have a single job that uses thousands of cores across different nodes. And because more than one node is being used, uh, the inter-node network latency is very important. Um, you can't just use standards um, Ethernet networking. You have to use have special low latency networking um, like InfiniBand, for example. And for the HPC, the problems themselves are normally much bigger, and you would sort of typically wouldn't run as many of them as you would with um, high high throughput computing. So HPC typically um, would use MPI, so this is message passing interface, so that's the standard way of um, being able to send messages between different processors on different nodes. And the applications used in HPC typically be, typically be written in sub languages like Fortran or C or C++, whereas HTC is sort of much wider variety of languages, including things like Python, which are becoming more popular. So at the sort of traditionally, uh, computing in Fusion has been primarily HPC, However, HTC is starting to slowly become um, more commonly used, and in the future, in particular, it will be there'll be much more of this. So, how do people in uh, the energy um, the fusion energy research community use computing resources? Um, so, this is I typically use what I would call a traditional HPC type workflow. Um, people would have users would have to SSH into the login node of a um, cluster somewhere, which could be local, it could be um, remote somewhere. They might have to upload any input data they need or configuration files. Um, they might need to build the software themselves or use sort of pre-installed software. They then create a sort of job submission script and then submit that job for batch clue, batch queue, then they'll just wait for some time, uh, which could be any amount of time really, wait for the job to finish running. Then when it has finished running, they would then download the outputs, they possibly copy it back to their um, laptop or desktop, and then finally analyze the results. So this is obviously not un um, unique to Fusion. It's, this is just generally how people do HPC computing. So of course, uh, while there are some applications which are quite simple and only depend on sort of one or two libraries, many actually are quite complex and require complex software environments and they might depend on a particular OS type or version. Um, there are lots of different languages used in the different applications used in the Fusion research. Um, there's Fortran, C, C++, Java, Python, Perl, Bash, IDL, MATLAB, all sorts of things. The different um, compiler types and versions being used. Um, some people use the GNU compiler, some people <clears throat> use commercial compilers like Intel or um, PGI. Obviously software can depend, has dependencies on other software, so and it's getting the right versions of standard software and libraries can be important, for example, for Python or glibc or almost anything else. Um, sometimes applications need to run <clears throat> either uh, commercial themselves or depend on commercial libraries, um, for example, the NAG, um, numerical libraries. And there are normally, and there are sometimes many custom libraries involved as well. So in the past, what since people generally just run the application on a single cluster, they'd make use of environment, environments modules. So these are um, set up by the administrators of the cluster and they just enable you to set up the environment, like environment, for example, the um, paths, um, paths for libraries and other environment variables, so that you can use a particular application and version of an application. And so I've got an example here showing 
um, an example for one Fusion application with all the modules that it requires. So the important thing to note is that these are all just specific to one particular cluster and if you try to do the same thing anywhere else it would of course not work because they probably haven't they have different modules installed. I mean it's because of that it's in Fusion though, some applications are actually generally only run on a few specific HPC clusters and there are different make files for each clusters. I mean sometimes if you want to run an application on a new cluster you have to get the developer to come over and like spend a week working on it to get it to actually um, build and run successfully and be validated. So the whole concept of portable software um, doesn't exist. However, the things are starting to change and the computing resource requirements are um, increasing and will definitely increase much more in the future. So if, um, the experiments are starting to produce more data. Um, for example, it will produce around two petabytes or more of data per day. So in a single day, it will produce more data than has been produced by all previous fusion experiments. It's um, new techniques. Um, people starting to use like uncertainty quantification. We need to run um, the same code for sort of large numbers of times for different parameters. So that obviously requires more computing. Um, there are increasing memory requirements. So a lot of some people start to um, need to um, store complex CAD models in memory that may um, require sort of hundreds of gigabytes or even terabytes of memory. It's also reducing time for intershot analysis. So Sometimes you want to do some data processing or analysis in between each of the shots in a fusion experiment, so each of the plasma pulses. And so as the so the times between shots is starting to decrease, plus the amount of processing is starting to increase. So you need to have, because of that, you need to have more um, computing resources. So in terms of access to computing resources, um, as I mentioned before, typically Fusion research centers would have their own um, HPC clusters. And as the computing requirements uh, increase, these are starting to get more and more full. And because of that, jobs having to wait in queues for sort of longer and longer. And as you might expect, that users don't really like that. They would prefer to get the results as quickly as possible. Um, so already, of course, people can get access to allocations on external HPC facilities if they need more resources. Um, so for example, in the UK, there's Dirac. That's Dirac is the UK's um, HPC facility for particle physics, astrophysics, cosmology, and nuclear physics. Um, for fusion, there's also a system called Marconi, um, which is in Italy's major um, supercomputing facility. So that's another one that's commonly, commonly used in fusion. But even these other systems are starting to become sort of more and more full. So along with that, the access to cloud resources is starting to become more common. Um, so by cloud, I don't just mean like someone using credit card to get access to a public cloud like Amazon or Azure or Google or whatever. Um, in our case, we have access to cloud computing resources through so various national and international science projects. In our case, it's through one project, a UK project called IRIS, and there's also a European project called European Open Science Cloud. And I'll just talk briefly about these two projects since they're probably not that well known outside of um, science. So first of all, IRIS. Um, so this is a UK project, which is a collaboration of um, user communities and research uh, resource providers working together. Um, so the, the reasons for this is that in not just Fusion, but in all sciences, the computing requirements are for both computers and data are getting larger and larger. So because of that, it starts to become more efficient to share resources rather than everyone to have their own dedicated resources. And also allows sort of more established communities to sort of share their experiences with others rather than everyone having to sort of reinvent solutions to the same problem sort of over and over again. Uh, so the infrastructure providers here are um, 
STFC, that's the Science and Technology Facilities Council. Um, they're responsible for a lot of um, the science research facilities for particle physics, astronomy, nuclear physics, and space science in the UK. And so, so DIRAC, as I mentioned, and GridPP. So GridPP, um, that's a collaboration that provides the computing resources for the Large Hadron Collider in the UK. So IRIS <clears throat> provides allocations to users from F from projects and groups which are associated with SCFC, including um, CCFE. Uh, so the, and these computing resources are mostly in the form of clouds, or, and they're typically sort of independent open stack clouds at different sites, not just a single resource. European Open Science Cloud, that's a much bigger European project. This is not just, even though the name suggests it's a cloud, it's actually much more than a cloud. It's a group of services, software and data, with the idea being that the European Commission wants a sort of single environment where people can share and analyse the data from all publicly funded research in Europe. So in practice, um, there have been two major projects so far, um, <clears throat> EOSC Pilot and EOSC Hub. The EOSC Pilots that um, had a budget of £10 million. And that was sort of the first phase of development of the European Open Science Cloud. And the next there's EOSC Hub, which is Thirty-three million pounds. That's finishing at the end of uh, euros. That finishes at the end of this year. Um, so that's, <coughs> excuse me, making uh, EOSC sort of heading it, making it sort of more of a production service that people can actually use. And at the moment, it's the third core currently open for forty-four million euros to uh, for EOSC operations. So just to give you an idea of what's involved in so we're getting together a little of large group of different resources, uh, services and data. In EOSC Hub, there's the services part, which is the data, different applications and tools, there's sort of baseline services like storage and computes. There's also training and consultants. There's also federated operations. So these are sort of things that you need sort of to have a federated infrastructure. Um, so things like SLAs, um, customer relationship management, certification of providers. You also have to have services to support the federated infrastructure, um, for example, a marketplace where people can find things, um, AI, so authentication, authorization, and identity. Counting is also important, so um, users know how much resource they've used, and <clears throat> infrastructure providers and the um, people who uh, provide the funding can see what's being used and sort of monitoring as well. And of course, there's also the policies and processes involved as well. So in practice, what a typical user might see is not all of that, but they would see something like the EOSC marketplace. So it's just a single sort of portal that enables users to um, find and search for different services and order them and gain access to them. And this is an example of what it looks like. So in terms of cloud resources in EOSC, um, these are mostly provided by an organisation called the EGI Foundation. So this was uh, originally created to coordinate and maintain the European grid infrastructure for the Large Hadron Collider. But now it's evolved beyond that. Um, it's one of the three coordinators of the EOSC Hub project. So one of their main, EGI's main services is the EGI Federated Cloud. So this consists of around 20 resource centres around Europe. Uh, these are mostly OpenStack, but clouds, but there are a few uh, open nebula clouds as well. So in terms of accessing computing resources, what we want to to look at at CCFE is 
how we can make use of academic and public clouds for fusion applications, um, how we can sort of extend our small scale on-premises facilities to cope with bursty workloads. So as I show in this um, diagram here, <clears throat> sometimes we have enough resources for all the computing we need to do, but other times I mean, we would be nice to have access to more resources and we want to be able to get access to those resources through a piece of clouds. And, and since we want to be able to make use of lots of other facilities, the important part of this is that we need to ensure that we can get the same results wherever we run and also, also make it easy to run your application anywhere. Okay, so first of all, talking about making applications portable. Um, so we need to be able to reliably run applications with complex dependencies anywhere. And basically, we not just want to be able to run a few sort of specific applications anywhere, but run any application that has any dependencies anywhere. So the idea of just having sort of pre-installed VMs with, well, with pre-installed software, that's not really an option. That's because you obviously just can't install all possible software. So the use of containers is the most obvious solution. So with this, instead of um, using the libraries and applications installed on the file system of a bare metal machine or VM, we use the container and then the application and all its dependencies are completely inside the container and no, there's no longer any dependency on the host themselves. This makes it this gives you the ability to have uh, much more portable applications. So this, so this gives users uh, freedom. They can have completely user-defined and controlled environments. You don't have to ask admins to install software for you. It gives you portable portability. You can develop your application on your laptop and know that it can be run anywhere else in a reliable way. And also gives you reproduce, reproducibility. So in the past, people didn't worry too much about reproducibility, but these days it's become much more important. So being able to re reproduce scientific results is um, very important today. And containers help a lot with that. So most people, of course, have heard of Docker Engine. Um, so we use Docker Engine for actually building the container images, um, sometimes either manually, or we could use GitHub and integration between GitHub and Docker Hub, or as part of an integration, a continuous, continuous integration workflow. However, for actually running containers, we don't typically don't use uh, Docker. We use a runtime called Singularity and also sometimes another one called UDocker. So Docker itself was not really designed for scientific computing. Uh, we don't want to run like web services or microservices or anything like that. We just run to, want to run computationally intensive batch jobs. So we don't need most of the features in Docker engine. And sort of on HTC and HPC clusters, users don't typically have root access. So as a result of that, they don't people don't have access to uh, Docker engine. So that's why un unprivileged container runtimes like Singularity and UDocker are sort of becoming quite common. So in terms of running HTC and HPC jobs on clouds, <clears throat> there are many existing open source and commercial solutions for doing this, um, probably even over 100 or more. It seems like almost every single person that wants to run jobs on clouds develops their own solution to this problem. Um, so it's not obviously a new problem. People have been doing this for sort of over 10 years um, or more from since when sort of Amazon first became available. So I think in general, there are sort of three types of ways of running batch jobs on clouds. Um, one approach is a cluster on demand. So this is where you would deploy a sort of complete self-contained traditional batch system, for example, Slurm. Um, entirely on a cloud, so we'd have a head nodes, worker nodes, <clears throat> and storage system. 
so then users would have to SSH onto head nodes to better interact with it. There's cloud bursting, sort of also based on a traditional batch system. This is where you would sort of add worker nodes to your that are deployed in the clouds um, to an existing on-premises batch system. So typically you make use of VPN so that the cloud worker nodes appear on the same network as the um, on-premises worker nodes. A lot of people make use of this approach as well. And there's also sort of more cloud native approach, which could be like involve Kubernetes, or it could be a sort of batch system as a service type thing that's running on a public cloud. So even though there are a lot of existing solutions to um, running HTC and HPC jobs in clouds, they didn't actually meet our requirements. They were sort of solving different problems. So, for example, they're bursting from a local batch system to a single cloud, or <clears throat> creating a batch system on demand on a single cloud, or looking at sort of very large scales, like deploying, like running tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, or even like having over a million cores in a batch system on a specific cloud. And a lot of the solutions that only supports limited clouds, for example, a few public clouds, or they only work with a single cloud at the same time. So if we just had a sort of credit card, a lot of money and a single public cloud, everything would be quite simple and you could just do what people have typically done in the past, where you just burst from a local cluster onto a single public cloud. However, in our case, we wanted to make use of um, many different clouds, both in IRS around the UK and also in the European Open Science Cloud. So our requirements, we want to be able to burst from our local resources to external clouds. Um, we want to be able to support as many clouds simultaneously, not just one or two clouds. Uh, and one important thing is we wanted to support opportunistic access to clouds. So I'll mention this a bit later, but in the European Open Science Cloud, sometimes we've only had opportunistic access. So we could just get access to the resources that other people weren't using. So in that case, we might get a few sort of CP, CPU cores here and there. Um, sometimes on one cloud we might get some, other times not. So we need to be able to sort of access different clouds sort of in a very dynamic way. And we want to be able to sort of support very sporadic usage and very small scales. So being able to <clears throat> scale usage of a cloud from or to zero is quite important for us. And in, and in particular, one thing, we didn't want to get locked into a single type of cloud. For example, like Amazon, we wanted to be able to use as many different types of clouds as possible. So that's why we developed our own uh, solution. So we developed the platform in the EOS Pilots project called Prominence. So the aim of this was to be able to give users the same experience that they would have with a traditional batch, traditional batch system, but instead of having a static group of worker nodes, any number of clouds around the world could be used, and they would <clears throat> not be aware of any of this. They would just submit their jobs, and the jobs would run, and in the backgrounds, lots of magic would happen. So here's just a sort of simple overview of the architecture of prominence. I'll talk a bit more about in talk a bit more about each part in detail in the coming slides. So make a lot of use of existing open source software, for example, Condor and another thing, Infrastructure Manager, but we also have our own software as well. Um, so for authentication authorization, we use an open ID Connect identity provider. So we want users to be able to log in with the standard credentials that they use. Uh, Condor gives us the job queue and the ability to remotely execute jobs securely and also provides hooks we can use for um, provisioning, provisioning and sort of cleaning up resources. We then have um, a resource provisioner. So this has to decide what clouds to use and then deal with like error handling and retries. And then we use infrastructure manager, which is the system that actually uh, provisions the infrastructure across the different um, clouds, making use of the different APIs. 
So first of all, uh, talking about interacting with prominence. So we wanted to move away from the idea of users having to SSH into login node to submit jobs. We wanted to have a sort of more cloud-like experience so you could submit and manage your jobs from anywhere. Um, so because of that, we decided on using a RESTful API and JSON. Uh, this is much more flexible than having SSH access to a login node. We can then use um, token-based authentication, authorization, um, OpenID Connect, which is very common these days. Um, we have a simple Python sort of based command line interface, and this is what gives people the sort of batch system-like experience. So they can easily uh, submit jobs, delete jobs, and check their status and things like that. Plus, because it's just a RESTful API, you can easily run jobs programmatically, um, and you can like use a Jupyter Notebook, for example, to submit jobs. So HT Condor is one of the sort of uh, main building blocks of um, prominence. Uh, there's sort of many reasons for selecting Condor. Uh, Condor was actually developed in the 1980s, but it's perfect for uh, cloud type environments. So there's, it's, designed to base, it's designed to handle worker nodes which are coming and going. There's no essential list of worker nodes unlike other batch systems like Slurm and PBS. The worker nodes are able to advertise that they exist and then they can be um, given jobs to run. The condor also gives the ability to um, have worker nodes over the public internet. So you can have a single condor batch system with worker nodes all around the world, which that's something that you can't really do with other batch systems. Uh, condor also that works very reliably at large scale. So Running 100,000 jobs is sort of not a big deal. People use it at much larger scales. And you can stream standard output and error back in real time. So for us, that's useful. So if people submit a job that will run for a week, they some would like to be able to check that it's actually working successfully and not just sort of wait until it fails at the end. So Conda gives us the ability to use this to be able to actually look at the standard output and error in real time, even if the jobs running on a cloud on the other side of the world. And so it's not really anything else that provides that same functionality. Uh, so we use Hooks in Condor to provision the worker nodes which are um, running on virtual machines. Uh, so we provision a VM when a job is submitted and then delete the VM when the job uh, completes. So we're using one virtual machine per job. So of course, if we were just had lots of very short single core jobs, this would be a very inefficient way of doing things because you'd be spending more time sort of creating and destroying VMs than you actually are running jobs. But in our case, the applications that we need to run would typically run for hours, uh, days, or sometimes even a week or more. So in this case, the time taken to deploy a virtual machine is very short compared to the actual uh, duration of a job. And as I mentioned before, um, in Fusion Research, we have to run a very wide range of applications. So, I mean, so one side effect of this is that there are a wide, wide range of resource requirements. So jobs could use anything up from one core up to thousands of cores, and they could use sort of any amount of memory as well, and also of different disk requirements. So if we, if we wanted to try and use sort of a sing, have multiple jobs running on a single worker node, then we would end up with lots of wasted resources. Um, resources. And because the jobs are very long running, that could sort of be quite wasteful. So having a single VM per job is makes things much more efficient for us. And it sort of helps to make it easier to distribute jobs across uh, multiple clouds. So one important part of this, of course, is to be able to deploy infrastructure on different clouds. We use something called Infrastructure Manager, which is, so rather than having to individually deal with all the different cloud APIs, we did, we use this as an infra, as a infrastructure layer. So we just have to interact now with a single API, irrespective of like whether we want to talk to OpenStack or Google, for example. 
So that makes things much simpler for us. And it also supports less common cloud APIs, which initially we had to use. So for example, some of the clouds we had access to use what's called the OCCI API with X509 authentication. So this is not very common and not many other systems support it, but it is supported by infrastructure managers. So that was <clears throat> one initial reason why we had to use it. So because we want to be able to use lots of clouds, we decided that we just use um, very simple vanilla um, Ubuntu images and install the required software on each virtual machine as they're deployed. Since the application's running containers, that's not much we actually need to deploy, we just install, we just need to install um, Condor and the container runtimes basically. And this is also taken care of by Infrastructure Manager. So since we're using many clouds, and in, so we have, we have to be able to decide which cloud to use to run each job. So important part of this is um, open policy agents. So open policy agent is a standard open source software um, from the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. It's an open source general policy engine. Um, so we, so what we do is we collect automatically collect information about each cloud and put store it in open policy agent. So for example, it's about images available on each cloud, what flavor, VM flavors are available, information about current quotas, um, if there've been any recent failures. And then we have policies to decide um, which, so policies to decide which clouds will meet a job's requirements. So for example, if a job requires 64 cores on a single node, not all clouds will support that of course. So you have to obviously pick the right one. And then we also have policies for ranking clouds based on job preferences. And all that is done using open policy agents. So once you have the ranks list of clouds meeting requirements, we then have to, we then try each cloud in turn until the deployment is successful. So one thing we found fairly early on is that failure handling is important, especially sort of private and community clouds. They can sometimes be a little bit unreliable. Um, so you might try deploying a VM once, but then if it fails, so you try a second time, it might work. So we have to automatically take care of this. So we can try several times on each cloud. And then if one that fails, we just move on to the next cloud. And we also have to deal with lots of timeouts and retries and things, because sometimes <clears throat> cloud APIs can hang. And all of this is sort of taken care of completely automatically and transparently and the user is not aware of any of this. So with this system, one thing we can do is what we call hierarchical cloud bursting. So instead of just bursting from one, our local resource to a single external cloud, we can say, first of all, burst to <clears throat> uh, sort of national research clouds. In our case, that would be in the UK. And then if we can't get any more resources on there, we could then move on to clouds in Europe. And in that case, if they're also, we can't get any resources, we can then move on to um, trying public clouds. And of course, we can use external clouds immediately if they provide um, requirements that aren't met by other clouds. So that, for example, if jobs need access to GPUs or <clears throat> low latency in interconnects, or they have sort of very high CPU or memory requirements. So an important part of this is it gives us the ability to use clouds opportunistically. So many academic research clouds are primarily used by just sort of one or two communities. So that, as in the people that are actually paying for them, but sometimes they're not full and they have other resources. And in this case, it's possible for other people to get access to these unused resources. So EGI and in the European Open Science Cloud, that's one way of getting access to these unused cloud resources. Sometimes it might just be a few cores on a cloud, other times it could be a few hundred cores. Um, so one thing we can do in prominence is to aggregate all of these other resources um, across multiple clouds, which and make them sort of much more useful. And this is a benefit to both users and providers. Users get, get access to resources that they might otherwise not have had. And providers 
can get access to and providers of course like the resources to be used as much as possible they don't like to see things empty so as well as compute um, jobs obviously need access may need access to data and generally it will um, generate output data so far we've mainly been dealing with simulation and modeling type jobs so these will typically have small amounts of input data but then have much larger output files which could be up to a few gigabytes per job but usually quite less than that in fusion the file size is normally at the moment quite small so our requirements for this is that we need jobs to be able to access input data no matter where they run uh, multi-node jobs need access to shared storage and users need to be able to access output data so typically what we need to do is to stage in the input data so copying copy in the data from remote storage to the job and then when the job has finished we can then do the stage out so that's where the um, data is copied from the job to remote storage uh, so we've mainly been using a Ceph plus with the s3 api for storing transient data um, so prominence provides a simple way for users to upload any input files and then downloads the output data generated by their jobs so it sort of makes things quite simple for them for multi-node mpi jobs running on clouds we need in that case a single application typically needs to access shared storage even though it's running across multiple nodes so for that we use we're using a storage system called BG, bgfs so this allows us to sort of aggregate both the performance and the capacity of all the nodes used for a particular job and sometimes you've we some users also want to have posix like access to storage so they can don't need to have a sort of stage in and stage out type process so for that um <clears throat> we provide a couple of ways of doing that um for example using web dev So before um, going through some of the use cases, uh, this, this slide just shows the sort of user experience and how it's similar to using a traditional batch system. So here's an example of submitting an MPI job. So in this case, at what uses 32 cores, uh, 64 gigabytes of memory and per node, and this user wants eight nodes. Um, in this case, it's an Intel MPI job, and there's a container image specified, and then there's a command to run. So users don't need to worry about what's anything about they don't need to even know what a cloud is that everything is taken care of they just run this command all the infrastructure is um, provisioned automatically by prominence and then the job is run and then similarly there are sort of commands for listing what jobs are running um, deleting jobs looking at the standard output scenario in real time which is quite important so just worth pointing out that a lot of the alternative platforms for running batch jobs on clouds sort of involve a lot more human involvement. So people might need to decide what VM flavors to use explicitly. They might need to manually run a command to deploy a cluster in the clouds. Um, users might need to sort of copy their uh, inputs, data and things to some sort of transit logging node in the cloud. And then you have to remember to delete the cluster afterwards. So in our case, sort of, we don't have any of that problem. Those problems, users just submit. They just have to run their jobs. They don't have to worry about anything else. So now I'll go through a couple of examples. So first of all, um, this is the first example that was successfully run using prominence. Um, this is for breeder blanket design. So one interesting, interesting thing about nuclear fusion reactors is that they can produce their own fuel. So tritium is one of the two ingredients used in nuclear fusion along with deuterium and it turns out you can actually produce tritium inside of a nuclear <clears throat> fusion reactor. So what happens is that it's something called a breeder blanket inside the reactor. This is um, made of lithium and this absorbs neutrons produced by the fusion process and then produces more tritium which is then in turn is the fuel that's used to power the reaction. So it's important to be able to sort of optimize the 
tritium production to get an efficient reactor. So um, this particular research was looking at doing that using um, three-dimensional CAD-based models. So in, this, so in this particular case, it involved running basically identical jobs many different times with different parameters. And there was some sort of machine learning type process that decided which parameters to choose and how to, and sort of how to decide on the best the parameters to give the best performance the best performance in terms of fit in production so this particular case the user was sort of quite familiar with clouds and did something quite clever i thought they had effectively self organizing jobs um, using mongodb for coordination so each job from the prominence point of view, it was completely identical, but it would each job would contact MongoDB to get the parameters to use. And then when the job finished running, it would then write the output data back into the MongoDB database. So that sort of made things quite straightforward. So for this um, use case, um, prominence allowed these jobs to be run across four different clouds across Europe over a period of about a month or so. And this, so this was successful and the research was published soon afterwards. So here's another case, which is a bit more of a typical example where this is so where jobs need to have some input data and configuration files, and then they generate output data, which then needs to be sort of sent back to the users. So this case is for something called JAMS, which is the Jet Application Management System. So this is a user interface for a variety of um, codes for simulating um, plasmas. So, and this was migrated from using a local HPC cluster to using prominence directly using the REST API. What happens is that the user has a sort of GUI application where they select all the the sort of setup. The application then generates what's called a run directory, which is just a directory containing all of the required configuration and data files. So a table of that is then uploaded to S3. It's only like a few megabytes in size in total. The job is then submitted to Prominence. Prominence then takes care of running this job in the cloud somewhere. And then when the job is finished, the users can trigger um, the download of the output data back to their home directory and they can then analyze the output. So, from the user's perspective, there's just sort of three steps. Um, there's the uploading the input data, submitting a job, waiting for it to finish, and then out, out, then downloading the output data. So it's sort of not any different to using a traditional batch system. But in our case, the job could be running on a, any number of different clouds. So, so far I've been mainly talking about HTC type jobs where jobs are running on single nodes, but in Fusion at the moment, over 90% of the jobs running our local clusters are typically uh, multi-node MPI jobs. And there are lots of different applications used in Fusion that are examples of jobs like this. So um, the clouds that we have access to in both IRIS and European Open Science Clouds don't actually have low latency in connects, so they don't actually have really don't really have the appropriate networking to run such jobs, but we thought it'd be interesting to just look at, is it possibly to, possible to usefully run the MPI jobs that used in Fusion on any of these clouds that don't have low latency interconnects? Because from our experiences, even if a user knows their job will run, take five times longer than it would on a, on a local cluster, they're happier if their job is running rather than just sort of waiting in a queue. And of course, it's also interesting to look at the effect of containers on the performance of multi-node MPI jobs since in prominence, we run all jobs in containers. Okay, so the first thing to look at is the effect of containerization on MPI um, performance. So the plot on the left-hand side of the slide here um, compares the runtime of an example job running on bare metal and in the singularity containers. This shows the runtime as a function of number of nodes. So 
ideally you'd want the runtime to decrease as the number of nodes increases. So in this particular case, we see that we did a test up to eight nodes and then the performance using singularity containers was basically identical to using bare metal. So the containerization didn't have any effect on the performance. However, if you look at the MPI latency between two nodes <clears throat> on a cloud just with standard networking compared to an HPC cluster, obviously there's quite a big difference in difference. So the plot on the, the top on the right hand side here shows the um, latencies in microseconds as a function of a function of the packet size of the messages. So you can see that the blue line at the bottom is the HPC cluster, which is very fast and has the low latencies. Whereas the OpenStack clouds that have this traditional step of sort of normal networking are much slower. And as sort of we expected, we do find out that jobs running in such environments are much slower. So the final plot here shows the runtime versus number of nodes uh, for an, for an MP, uh, MPI application. Um, so the blue line is on the HPC system and the orange line is on the OpenStack cloud. I can see the performance on the clouds, the runtime increases as the number of nodes increases, which is not what you want. So we have, it's a little bit more complicated this. We found sometimes using two nodes might, some applications might give good performance, but then after that it gets worse. Other times using two nodes would also fail. And it was a sort of little bit too unpredictable and users were sort of not happy about that. If it was, if they could, users could sort of reliably know that a job would run slower, that would be fine, but they didn't like this. The idea that it could sometimes, it might be faster with a couple of nodes or sometimes it might be slower. So that's, they're not, weren't entirely happy with this, but that's, we didn't really <clears throat> expect it to be too successful. So it's just worthwhile pointing out that if you do have a cloud that does have um, networking design for HPC, then you can get good results. So for example, on Oracle clouds that, that has bare metal resources available that do have that and with low latency networking. So here's two different fusion applications. Um, again, comparing the wall time versus number of nodes at comparing Oracle to um, an HPC system in Cambridge. And we can see that on the clouds, the performance does, the wall time does decrease as the number of nodes increases and the performance is actually similar to or slightly better than the traditional, traditional HPC system. So another thing we can do in prominence which I haven't spoken about yet is workflow. So this is when you have um, groups of job with dependencies. So in many areas of science, it's, quite common to have a sort of splitting and merging type things where you have, might have a single job which then generates lots of, but then, then after that needs to run lots of different jobs in parallel. And then the results of all of those then get, because they're merged together in a merge step at the end. So this is another type of thing that we can do. And in fact, we can have the different steps in a workflow running on different clouds, or in fact have some of the steps in a workflow running on clouds and other steps running on HPC systems. So far, we haven't had any actual um, specific use cases for this, but we will have some coming up probably later this year. And then one final thing is that everyone, people would normally say that containers enable you to run applications everywhere, but that's you have to be careful that's not entirely true. Um, it's quite common to, with, for example, like Intel compiler to um, optim when you're compiling to opt optimize your software for specific architectures. Um, so for example, if you mostly have um, Intel Skylake CPUs, you might optimize your binaries for AVX 512. So you then get the best performance on the Intel Skylake processors, but then if you try running it on systems with other processors, it then doesn't work. Then, it, then if you tried to compile for an 
refiner is optimized for different architecture that's sort of more portable, then you get worse performance. But in Intel's case, they have an option that enables you to um, compile a sort of multi-architecture binary. So you can have a single binary that then will work on a variety of different platforms and give good performance. So for us, doing things like this is quite important because while on public clouds, you can sometimes specify what processes types you want to have on the clouds that's sort of research type clouds we have access to, you don't have that choice. A single cloud may just have Skylake or they may have some sort of combination of different processes. In some cases they have like combinations of different Intel processes and AMD, but you, there's not really any way to select between them. So in this case, it's sort of important to be able to create, create a container image which will work everywhere, but still will give the sort of hopefully the best possible performance. Okay, so I've just given a sort of overview of the work that um, we've been doing on enabling the Fusion Energy Research Community to make use of distributed cloud resources. I'm um, in the coming year we sort of expect a lot more work on uncertainty quantification so this will involve running large numbers of HTC jobs um, across different clouds so that will be quite interesting. Um, one of the experiments at CCFE will be sort of ramping up in the coming months and we want to be able to demonstrate the intershop processing between on the clouds sort of as an alternative to the tradition, traditional way of doing it. The STEP project is likely to have lots of HTC and HPC type jobs, so being able to access clouds might be quite important for that. Um, there's a fusion use case for a future H2020 project that involves both HPC and AI running, making use of GPUs on the cloud. And we've also obtained funding recently for making problems available in the European Open Science Cloud. So the idea of this is that we can it'll be useful for the long tail of science so this will sort of so as in helping individual researchers or some small groups that don't have access to are not part of a large collaboration sort of with an established computing model but they would like to have some ways to easily access um, cloud computing resources and prominence is one way of doing that and so thank you Andrew, thank, thank you so much. That was a truly fascinating uh, talk. Um, and good computing in this research context is all about enabling the researchers and the scientists. And that's what you guys have done. You know, whereas before they're sitting in a long queue waiting for their, their analysis to run, they're now enabled to get it out there and running as quickly as possible. So truly remarkable. Uh, so um, in terms of uh, questions, uh, you should all have access to um, the questions panel or, or be able to submit questions. Um, I will try and um, pull those up and share them. So um, I'm just going to assign question to Andrew as we get going. Um, and um, there's also an opportunity to raise hands, but if we can hold off for, uh, for a moment in terms of raising hands. So um, Andrew, can you see that question from a familiar name? Um, yes, I can see the <laughs> question. Uh, for the so should I just read out that question so the audience knows oh, what's being asked? What's the ratio okay. between your data in and data out for typical fusion codes on clouds? Is the ratio growing, and do you have to pay for the data movements? Uh, for the clouds that we have access to in IRS. And in the European Open Science Cloud, we don't have to pay for the data movements. That's free. Um, in terms of the data ratio, most of the jobs we've been looking at so far are sort of simulation type jobs. So the there's either sort of no input. Well, so the inputs like in the order of kilobytes or in some cases megabytes. And then the output files sort of typically sort of tens of megabytes or sometimes hundreds of megabytes. So the data volumes are quite small, but there's much more data coming out than is going in. 
Thank you, Andrew. Uh, so um, others, please do put in questions and whilst we're waiting to see if others want to ask them, can I can I ask a question, Andrew? Um, uh, yes, that's fine. In, in terms of uh, training users, there's there's some people will be very adept at creating their own containers um, and, you, and learning how to use the new prominent system. Do you have to invest a lot of time and effort into helping people learn how to create their own containers? That's actually probably the hardest part for users since in Fusion at least some of well some of the young I guess the younger people are sort of more familiar with containers and know how to build them but in general people are not that familiar familiar with containers and in some cases actually don't even have access to a system that has Docker installed on it. So yeah helping them to build containers that's sort of quite a major part of it. So you have to and run actually, some kind of consultancy to you to help them do that? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, so I've just shared another question with you from Yuri. Uh, what is your opinion about use of quantum computers instead of HPCs? Uh, in Fusion I'm not aware of anyone looking into quantum computing yet. That's probably something for the future. Well, we're hoping to have a talk, um, another talk about quantum computing in the um, in the next program. So uh, hopefully that will inspire everybody. Okay, that would be interesting. Does anybody have any other questions? If you'd rather um, raise a hand, I can probably uh, hold on. See, okay, there's an, another one. Hold on. Okay, so the question is, in terms of your intensity quantification requirements, how many runs do you normally need to get a sufficient data set for a good set of results? At the moment, I can't actually answer that. Um, the, there have been people who have been looking at UQ stuff um, recently, but then they're sort of not yet sort of doing it in production yet, so that's sort of still getting everything set up and ready to, I'm now using the code for doing this and I'm still sort of getting things set up. So don't actually have an answer to that question yet, but probably in a few months time that will change. This will be starting that work probably very soon. Okay Andrew, I've just shared another one. Um, are any parts of prominence open source or do you plan to make any of it open source? Uh, yes, Provenance is open source and as part of the funding we've obtained from EGI we will definitely make it available and make write lots of good documentation so people can easily install it themselves. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, okay, they're coming in thick and fast now. Um, so there was a question about missing the beginning and does, uh, do you use Kubernetes in, in, in your system? Uh, not at the moment. Um, the, most of the clouds we have access to, if um, don't for, like the OpenStack clouds we have access to, don't typically don't have even um, the Magnum project installed. So we'd have to sort of manage the Kubernetes cluster ourselves. And as we're using sort of lots of clouds opportunistically, and want to be able to scale to zero, having to if we get access to, for example, eight cores on a single cloud, we don't want to have to provision a Kubernetes cluster just to use those eight cores. So we just use directly um, virtual machines. In the future, if we can get access to more resources, which are sort of just directly Kubernetes, then that would be nice. And we could easily make direct use of um, Kubernetes clusters. But at the moment, not, that's not really necessary. Thank you. Um, and the next one is uh, high performance computers are very expensive for universities, uh, but the computation on clouds is not expensive, question mark. Um, so, you know, I was going to ask a similar question uh, around the, the charging mechanism. Go ahead. And we've done testing of HTC jobs on Azure, Google and Amazon. And we, earlier this year, we did a 
proof of concept of running HPC jobs on Oracle. Um, definitely at the moment, HPC jobs on a cloud is more expensive than having an on-premises cluster. Do you see a, a way that you can develop prominence to kind of give an indication of some kind of charging mechanism, even if it's only by token? Because presumably, the organisation that's that's using it has to fund those chargeable services. Can you recharge back to the grants, for example, when somebody uses one of one of the um, uh, corporate clouds? At the moment, <clears throat> we well, I guess there are, well, this, it's a complicated answer to that question. Um, for the instance we have for the European Open Science Cloud, people are, with the credentials that with the credentials that people are providing, they that's same credentials then used to access the cloud. So they basically already have to have access to the appropriate clouds and have so they have to be given access by the administrators and have all the funding in place to deal with that. If they don't, then it just won't work. Um, one other thing we're doing is the ability for individual users to be able to add their own clouds easily to prominence. So at the moment, the administrator of the prominence has to set up all the different clouds, but in future we'll have it set up so that users can add their own clouds. So in that case, they would provide their own credentials to access a cloud so then it's sort of there and then entirely responsible for the funding and paying Understood. for it. Yeah. Okay so there's one, there's one last question here uh, in the question panel um, and then we'll uh, open it up for anybody to raise their hand and ask, ask a question. Um, so well somebody snuck in uh, just just very quickly actually but um, is the RS cloud big enough compared to EOS cloud resources? Does the UK have sufficient cloud resources for UK researchers? At the moment in IRIS, I think there are around 14,000 cores available to researchers, which obviously it would be nice to have more, but that's at the moment, that's what could be bought with the funding that was available. Okay. And in future, that's going to, I think, in, normally each year they try to um, increase and deploy some more hardware. So over time that will change and thank slowly. You thank you. Okay, so um, I'm going to open it up to the floor. Um, there is one more question, but it's from somebody's asked rather a lot of questions. So um, if you wouldn't mind hanging on at the end, I'll open up the mics and people can have a chat with you. Um, does anybody have want to raise a hand or um, ask any other questions? Nobody's raising hands. Okay, so what I'm going to try and do is take, uh, that's going to work. I was going to hope to try and take everybody's um, uh, mic, switch everybody's microphones on so that we can, um, we can say thank you. Okay, I was hoping to be able to unmute you all. You'd have to unmute yourselves if you... Uh, if you want to, but Andrew, uh, a really, really interesting talk. Thank you so much. Um, Brian, uh, uh, do you want to say anything else about next year's programme at this point? No, I don't think so. I think you summarised it all very well at the beginning. Um, we're, we're working on it at the moment. Um, just uh, uh, keep an eye on the website. And if you want to join the uh, the uh, the email feeds uh, let us know and uh, you should get those uh, as things as and when things come available so we look forward to seeing everybody in the uh, the new year um thank you very much so um andrew thanks again i'll clap you won't be able to hear everybody else clapping unless they unmute their microphones um some people begin to do that so thank you very much it's a really really interesting talk Uh, Andrew, do you want to hang around just to kind of have a brief chat with anybody who wants to, to ask uh, ask any last minute questions one to one? I guess that's fine with me. Uh, you've had a long session, so I really appreciate that. For everybody else, thank you very much. Uh, you can sign off now or stay on for a quick chat.
Thank you, Andrew. That was good. And, and Andrew Lahif, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. I mm, hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> it was great. Very good. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, somebody called A. Vadgama, you had one more question, but you, you, had, you asked quite a lot. Did you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, go ahead. No, maybe not. Oh, excuse me. May I ask you: uh, Is it possible to to have some contact details, uh, maybe to uh, exchange uh, some uh, results? Uh, presumably, you mean with Andrew Lahif? Yeah. Uh, we say yes, yes, with presenter. Yes. Uh, that's fine with me. Mm -hmm. But uh, are your contact details available somewhere? I can't find any email address, for example. Um, possibly not. <laughs> so, Yuri, I can see your email address. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, can I copy it? Copy email address to clipboard. So, um, Andrew, with your permission, I'll, I'll send Yuri um, your, do, do you want to send your work email address? Or shall I get, well, I'll tell you what. I'll send you Yuri's email address, and then you're in 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 a position to to contact him. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll I'll reply yes. to that then. Perfect. Yes, yes. Okay. No, just the reason why I'm asking is um, um, the presenter mentioned about the uh, simulation uh, modeling simulation uh, <clears throat> of uh, Takamak, and um, well, I'm looking a little bit uh, in uh, systems uh, identification to obtain mathematical models of uh, process and uh, non-linear systems uh, uh, including for uh, such type of uh, systems so it would be interesting for me maybe to <clears throat> do a modern simulation uh, uh, but your advice will be very useful in which direction better to concentrate i mean i personally i'm definitely not an expert on um, fusion modeling or plasmas or anything but i can put you in touch with people who are if you're interested I guess mm -hmm. yes yes it would be excellent thank you very much okay anybody else or shall we let Andrew have a well and rest thank you very much Andrew in fact both Andrews so uh, it was a very interesting talk absolutely oh thank you okay thanks very much then I'll I'll stop, I'll, I'll stop the uh, the show now. So speak to you all soon. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.